Choir of the Earth, I am Ben and I are deeply honoured uh, to have John Rutter CBE with us this evening. Uh, John, a very good evening to you. My pleasure to be with you. Um, and it is a deep honour that, that you've spent some time with us and I know that the choir will be uh, fascinated to hear what we have to say. Um, I think, Ben, would I be right in saying we've probably sung as many of John's pieces in our 24 months of history to being together the, than anyone else's compositions? I was I was counting them up. I think you're right, Mark. I think, uh, John, you, you hold the record for the most number of works that we've sung. It's uh, 17 at last. And I'm not even dead yet, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Who could have foreseen that? We've only done one of Handel's, although that oh, is quite a big one. Right. Um, and, but, no, and, and, of course, you were the first composer that we reached out to after our initial... Uh, uh, initial blast of Messiah back then in 2020 uh, and so it was your music for the first summer school and we've um, we delighted and, and thrilled to come back to to your uh, wonderful output things like obviously our Christmas uh, performance last year and we did your um, American folk songs uh, in the summer so we really have loved singing your music over the last couple of years and just thank you for all of your support and encouragement um, which has just been uh, really essential, particularly in those early, early months when this was a very new art form. We were all taking steps into the unknown. Um, there was a technology that nobody had mastered, really, because no one had had any reason to. And there were, there were projects like Eric Whitaker's Virtual Choir, um, yeah. which came before the whole uh, pandemic. But that wasn't really followed up with anything in particular. It didn't become something with a regular membership or um, regular meetings. And so in a way we were confronted with the lockdown situation. And of course, singers want to sing and we couldn't do it together. And so musicians, I like to think are practical and resourceful people in general. And so rather than sit there and bewail a bad situation, I think, oh, well, what can we do about this? Exactly. And um, of course, you, Mark, and you, Ben, along with others, have come up with an extraordinary solution uh, that has opened up whole new pathways in the choral world. And uh, that might never have happened but for the pandemic. And of course, it was a terrible thing for the whole world, which we would all rather have not happened. Yeah, it's true. But we do have to say that some positive things came out of it. Well, indeed. And it, it meant that uh, our, our singers, our friends, who are now part of our, 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 I wouldn't say our family, but well, yes, maybe, maybe our family, Ben, maybe they are part of our family. And they, they have just so loved singing alone yet together, John, I think is the answer, because when we mix everybody's voices and we play them back in a concert performance, you know, it's so moving when you know that you are in the, um, in, in, in the concert itself. It's, it's a very, very real moving experience for me and many others. Well, you will have been in the front line of getting feedback um, from the participants. And uh, I've been getting the ripples, let's say, because I've certainly become aware that there are all kinds of people who, for whatever reason, um, were not in a choir before, um, perhaps because they lived in a remote place. If you're in the Outer Hebrides, you know, there aren't too many local choirs you could join, I imagine. And um, if possibly you have mobility issues and find it hard to actually get out and about, or if there is somebody you're caring for at home and you can't really leave them for terribly yeah, long, likely. Or, or if you work in one of those things like the airline industry, where your schedules are just completely unpredictable, and you cannot say every Tuesday evening for the next 10 weeks, I'm going to be there for yeah. rehearsing the Verdi Requiem. Yeah. And uh, if you're a medical professional, similarly, you, know, yeah. you don't know when you're going to be available. Yeah. Um, people's working lives, I think, are very much less predictable than they were when I was starting out. Mm. When nobody really went anywhere terribly much in the 1950s, <laughs> really, because there was no way you could go. And uh, of course, the world has changed. And uh, this whole virtual choir phenomenon, I think, has 
made a family out of people who would love to be part of a choir, um, but have not been able to. So I think that's a whole constituency that has been brought into the world of choral singing, which is amazing. Plus, of course, all of those who were members of choirs yes. um, were suddenly cut off from something which was not just musically important, but socially important as well. Yes. Um, because often the evening choir rehearsal, um, yes, it's there because of the music, but um, we all enjoy the coffee and the gossip and the catch up with friends, or the new friends we make, old friends we keep yeah. in touch with. Yeah. An awful lot of friendship is about communal experiences. Yeah. And those are generally a bit of a threatened species in the modern world. But I think you'll find that membership organisations where you have to actually put some effort in uh, are all struggling a bit. Not all of them, but um, women's institutes and Boy Scouts and Girl Guides, I think are having to work rather harder for their members and choirs are having to work rather harder yeah. to find their members. Whereas organisations like joining the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds or something like that, where it doesn't actually demand anything of you, they're all doing fine. Yes. those kind of yes. membership organizations and we all know that um, any kind of communal activity in a community does bring that community together there was a survey famously done in Italy I think where they looked at the link between um, two things one was sporting activity the other was musical activity in a locality and linking that to levels of delinquency vandalism and crime and they found that where there was the highest local participation in activities like singing in a choir or playing in a football team the levels of all the bad things like crime delinquency depression and so forth uh, were all lower and so um, if we needed any um, demonstration that singing is good for you, particularly when you do it um, with groups of people, um, I think there is now at least one scientific survey, which I think has shown that it does bring all kinds of benefits to society. Um, I think we know that in the choral world, and we know that um, that coming together uh, just makes you feel better at a, at a human level, really, because singing expresses something that's deep inside you. It expresses your humanity. It expresses your soul. And when you put people together, then it becomes, in a way that's very hard to explain, something that's greater than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, of course, we don't always appreciate um, the benefits that we enjoy with the things that we do until we're deprived of them. Well, this is and true. I think it may well be the case that quite a lot of people sort of went along to their local choral society, enjoyed it, sang their church choir, enjoyed that, and didn't realise how much it meant to them yes. until they weren't able to do it anymore. And that's really, um, I think, part of the reason that the whole virtual choir phenomenon has sprung up, um, that it has actually kept those who do sing regularly um, in gainful employment, as it were, um, and able to enjoy in a different way something that's so important to them. And it's brought in a whole constituency of people who, for whatever reason, never were part of the choral community before. And you can't have an international choir, not one that meets every week. Um, but of course, that is possible with a virtual choir. So it's opened up whole new fields of possibility. And uh, uh, yes, as you said, Mark, I mean, it is not the same as meeting together in the flesh week by week. Um, if you're in a cathedral choir, day by day. For day yeah. 
Um, but my goodness me, it does give you something mm. um, and a, a, a rather lovely experience in its way. And actually, um, when you work, uh, I mean, I've heard from a number of cathedral organists about this, um, when they are actually rehearsing the individual choristers um, by Zoom, one by one, um, they can give them much more individual attention than when they're all together as sort of 16 um, kids together in one room at the same time. And these days, nobody likes to single anyone out and um, say, you know, you're flat or you're, you're, you're not keeping up with the others or whatever. Yeah. Um, but when you have got them one on one and there's no embarrassment of other people being um, present, you can actually give them individual attention and help them in a way that is not quite so possible when they're all there together. So there are definite pluses, um, I would say, um, Zoom rehearsal can be a very good way of doing it, and there are a certain number of practitioners, I mean, Ben, you're obviously one of them, who have mastered the art in um, very short order. Um, I think, ben, John, I would say Ben is the master. Well, and, well and, I, I, do want to, I do want to jump in and say that we don't use Zoom to rehearse. No, OK. We, we, we deliver, and that was a, a conscious decision, I think, early on, um to because because obviously we we started this it was a, a phone call from mark um i would have been after i think only two weeks or so in lockdown uh you know you don't know me but i want to do messiah in lockdown and i actually said to him you're mad uh you know the work to put all that together is insane um but i ended up saying yes and then it Thank just God. came to how are we going to teach you know potentially thousands of people at the same time um, without this business of lag and delay. And oh, so, no, all the time lag, I know. Well, a nightmare. So we've decided to focus, instead of this multi-window with lots of different faces, um, on just broadcasting onto YouTube, which is a different method to many of the other digital choirs. Yes. But I thought the focus had to be, it, I didn't want people sat at home looking at everyone else. I see. Mm. And I had the idea that when you're at a choir rehearsal, you don't turn and look at everyone else. You look at the conductor. And well, the, you're supposed to. You're supposed to. Yes, I know. <laughs> In an ideal world. Um, and the, the, the focus, therefore, had to be on the relationship between the teacher and the singer. So it was uh, very much down to me to you know, d direct my teaching into the camera, um, very much with this idea of, well, I can't see or hear the singers at home. Um, I see their comments streaming up in the live chat, but I direct everything into the camera with the idea of if I if I just project this teaching into the camera, I'm going to believe that everyone at home is doing what I'm asking them to do, um, which puts a lot of trust and responsibility onto the singer, but then takes away this this aspect of, you know, where someone might be singing their spouse walks through the background or the cat jumps up or something and just allows them to focus on the music. And, uh, and instead, yes, we're reading live chat going up the side. And you don't find it disconcerting that you can't actually hear what they're doing. Uh, does that worry you? That's a really good question. I mean, in the, in the early days, it was something we had to get used to, but right. it is, it's a matter of, of trust and faith, I think, in, in the singers. I know that what we will get out of the, the uh, process at the end in terms of recording, I mean, we've heard enough of the product now to know that what people will produce will be great. And any little errors, any little mistakes will be smoothed out by our, our team of engineers who are phenomenal. Um, I, I felt it was just that much more important to just trust that what people were doing is working now obviously we use um uh, recordings and that wonderful fieri consort and thank you so much for introducing them to us they are amazing they produce these guide tracks which we use so when yes. i'm conducting i'm conducting them yeah so uh it's it's effectively like the the choir have one of the best singers in the world standing next to them singing into their ear whilst they're watching me conduct and that process just produces some wonderful results good so, in a sense, I don't need to see any yeah. of them. I know that they've got, you know, great guidance. And, um, yeah, it's it's been a really... A really let, let me ask you, Ben, do you have a background, though, in classroom music teaching? Absolutely, yes. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> what age group? Well, uh, interestingly, everything. 
everything. So, I, I, when we first started working with you, I think I, I did take a, a brief moment to thank you for your inspirational composition, which has just been part of my life. For I think I, I first sang some of your music at the age of 12, and it literally changed the way I thought about music. I've loved it. So all the way through my life, I've had your music sort of as, as part of as part of it. So when I went into teaching, I, I brought in uh, council choirs and, uh, oh, and okay. the Gloria and the Requiem and all of your lovely music. Um, but I trained as a secondary school music teacher, um, was a head of music and a director of music for many years, ended up teaching in primary school as well, because it was one of oh, these right. multi-academy oh. trusts. So I had responsibility from reception right up to A-level and delivered music across all of it. Um, so yes, the, the, there is that sense of I'm standing here in front of you. Half of you aren't listening. Half of you are asleep. Let's see if we can make some music. Um, oh, yeah. you know, it, it's your job to inspire them. Yeah. Um, I, 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 forgive me for interviewing you for a minute, but do you view with concern the way that with the IB coming in in more and more schools? that um, music as a GCSE and A-level subject is apparently dwindling in numbers. It's not just um, apparently, it is absolutely um, uh, dwindling in numbers. I think it's a terrible state of affairs. And uh, just a little aside, the, the state of music in primary schools is the one that's worrying me at the moment. Mm. Um, well, son... that's the, the age when it matters. I mean, the last time I met um, a very old friend and colleague, um, Sir Stephen Cleabury, uh, was on the day when he actually got the serp it um, because he was already it was clear um, ill with not very long to go but he was determined that he would um, sort of on behalf really of the whole profession of choral music he wanted to be there at Buckingham Palace um, when he could receive his knighthood and there was a luncheon afterwards um, for a few friends, um, which I was present at and sat, I actually sat next to him and said, um, Stephen, if you had a um, hundred million pounds um, suddenly available to spend on music, what would you spend it on in this country? And he immediately said, fix music education. Mm -hmm. And I think he would very much have said, uh, start at primary level, because that's when kids either get the chance to sing or they don't. Absolutely. And um, see, my generation was lucky in a way um, for all kinds of reasons. I was born just after the end of the war. And uh, the idea in education was still influenced by the Rudolf Steiner ideas um, of, um, educating the whole child, that um, you had the, the healthy mind and the healthy body. And uh, we had to do lots of singing, um, which I loved, and uh, lots of what they called Swedish drill, sort of jumping around and all that, which I didn't love, um, but I'm sure it was terribly good for me. And lots of arts and crafts. And that was still the tail end of a kind of 1930s ideal of education, which had filtered across from the continent to Britain. Now, um, it changed, uh, partly, I think, because of uncomfortable associations with Nazi Germany, um, that the idea of a, a whole lot of children dressed identically, um, you know, marching around and um, doing rhythmic movements, synchronised swimming and all that kind of thing, um, had slightly uncomfortable resonances. And there came a, a new wind blowing in the education world saying, well, um, you know, choirs are all very well, but they're old fashioned, they're elitist and they um, hijack the ownership of the musical experience, um, you know, which should belong to the child. And, um, oh, come on, uh, you know, but um, that actually was, in a way, why um, choral singing and music generally in schools began to decline, or let's say not be backed as wholeheartedly as it was, because when I was a kid, every school had a school choir, and simple as that. And it's like swimming. If you never try it, you don't find out whether you might love it or not. You have to give it a try. And there are some kids 
Um, I suppose I would say I was usually in a class of about 30 kids. There were maybe three or four or five who really couldn't match pitches. Uh, and perhaps there were good reasons for that and maybe their, their singing talent could have been unlocked. But it was only ever really about 10% at the most who were not natural singers. And the rest of us really not only could sing, but did sing. And the school I went to had a former headmaster who said, look, every boy in this school should learn to read music. It's just basic literacy, um, not just the obviously musical ones, but every boy in the school should be able to sight sing well enough to be able to sight sing a hymn tune. And that we pretty much could, and a school of 650 of us, um, again, this is a good educational thought. Um, don't always give them a choice. Uh, when we entered the school, we had a voice test. And anybody who got half a voice at the sort of manager scale and could be assigned to one voice part or another, right, you're in the concert chorus, uh, which was the big, um, not very elite group, but it was half the school. And so um, Messiah was one of the ways that my musical journey started. Another was in my first year in the senior school, Haydn's Creation, which I loved then and I, I still- that's one of your favorites. Yes, I know, um, that will be a project. And then the Bach B minor mass, um, and that was, I think, what established Bach in my mind as my favorite composer, top of my tree. Well, once you were, John, once you were there, you were hooked, weren't you? Once you were there, you were in, and you knew that yeah. this was something you wanted to be associated with. Oh, yes. For your life, really, I suppose. Um, well, I was very lucky, um, but uh, you see, I wasn't the only one. Um, that there was more of a musical culture in the school system in, in the years I passed through it than I think there probably is now. And there wasn't, of course, such diversity of musical interests. I mean, there are lots of gifted kids um, in sort of inner city schools who may be a terrific at rap or working with electronic keyboards and yeah. So on, um, where they may never learn to read and write music, but they can actually make music. Yeah. And that's great. I mean, nobody could possibly be against that. But at the same time, the bedrock of our musical culture has to be classical, really, because it's built on century by century. And you can progress from there to anything, it seems to me. Yeah. And so I do think it's deeply worrying, as you do, Ben, that um, it seems not to have quite such a prominent place in our school life yeah. as it once did. The other thing, of course, is that every school day had to begin with an act of Christian worship. And we might sort of roll our eyes and smile and think, oh, you know, for goodness sake, that sounds like 100 years ago. But it really wasn't. It was um, the 1944 Education Act, um, which was um, a, quite a visionary document, really, um, because the war was going to end. Um, every child had to have a decent education and the government um, desperately wanted the church, who owned an awful lot of the schools up and down the country, to hand them over to the state. And uh, they did a wonderful imaginative deal, really. Um, Archbishop William Temple was one of the last things he did before he died. I think he died around 1944, thereabouts. And the government came to him and said, look, we want the church schools. Um, and he said, OK, you can have them on two conditions. One is that there's one weekly lesson of religious instruction, you know, Bible study, call it what you will. Mm -hmm. And the second condition was that every school day must begin with an act of Christian worship. Now, you couldn't do that now because there's so much more faith diversity yes. and yes. all of that. Um, but... Um, that was observed. Mm. And um, from when I was just little, um, every day started with 15 minutes of assembly and we sang all things bright and beautiful and when a knight won his spurs in the stories of old and um, oh God, I help in ages past and all of that. And uh, I think all of us um, learned a, a, a common repertoire of song that has stayed with us. Yeah. And, 
uh, we all discovered that the whole school to sing together. Now, um, why did all that crumble? Partly because um, comprehensive schools came in and they were too big to be able to fit the whole school into one place all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you lost that sense of communality as it yes. were. Yeah. And the other thing was it was getting difficult to find um, leaders of a Christian event among the teaching staff because there were perhaps not many of them who would have felt that they were comfortable doing that. Plus, of course, as in primary schools, you unfortunately um, increasingly got nobody who could actually play the piano or even manage a few guitar, guitar chords on the staff. Um, so one way and another, um, that crumbled away. And it was still supposedly enshrined in law, but the dear old Church of England was too polite ever to enforce it and say, oi, you know, you're not keeping it up and it is, it is law and you're not doing it and so it it became I don't know what in the 60s and into the 70s something that was increasingly forgotten about but it was where I got my first singing experience when I was just four or five years old and I remember thinking I wish the whole school day was like this because I really really love it mm -hmm. and um, it, it, then there was sport which I was no good at um, you know, being cold and muddy on a football field and all of that. But um, I was able to contribute to a team activity. Um, and I th that, that felt good, um, you know. And so um, I don't know whether that echoes your early experiences, Mark. I mean, at school, I mean, did, well, did you start I, with school assemblies each day? <laughs> It, yeah, it's a very interesting question, John, because um, I went to a school where we were um, fortunate enough to be able to meet together as one um, mm. and and singing. And we went every day and and singing together is something that that you remember for the rest of your life. I mean, yeah. it, for all faiths and none, I think I would say. Um, yeah. In fact, the other yeah, on Saturday, do you, we, we we were at uh, a, I was at a fantastic seventieth birthday of one of our um, course directors, Ralph Allwood. Oh, um, bless his heart! Mm. And Ralph, who has taught us some fantastic courses to do with hymns and even song and um, some Beatles and some Abba, <laughs> um, and he had this concert, and he, he was saying that he's working with the local Pimlico. Uh, schools to provide yeah. singing experiences for young children and it's really taking off and the children love it and blah blah so it's not I think John that, that the children don't like it anymore oh no it's just that they haven't it's been time. given the opportunities it's time, um, it? that you had um, and maybe through the 70s 80s 90s other people didn't and and, yeah. and so hopefully well, fingers well, crossed if, if I can chime in gentlemen as someone who did go to a comprehensive school in the 1980s yeah there was still a culture of coming together and singing hymns all That's the way great. through up my yeah. school. Um, yeah. And it was a fairly rough comprehensive, I do have to say, but it was that experience, both primary and secondary school. Much Usually it comes music. down to one inspirational, maybe head teacher or director of music. My, um, my, uh, my uh, head uh, of music, uh, uh, my head of music, Mr. Norris, um, who uh, first introduced me to your music, John, actually. He, oh. he said, I've got this, I've got these two pieces and uh, it's uh, all, uh, all things bright and beautiful and for the beauty of the earth. And we all went, because we knew the hymn versions. He went, no, listen to this and yes. played them to us. And particularly for the beauty, for me, it just completely captivated us. Oh, and thank we, you. Thank it was a, well, and honestly, beautiful, beautiful stuff. And we had a four part choir in our mm. um, comprehensive school. And uh, there was such a, a feeling of accomplishment uh, whenever we performed in harmony, um, we were never quite good enough to sing the uh, the requiem as a school choir. But of course, all of the school choirs fed into the local youth choir, and so the Havering Youth Choir, which you actually came and conducted, John, when I was oh. fourteen, you okay. came along to in, in Romford, uh, where I'm from. Romford, yes, dear Romford, and there was an American orchestra over, and we did the three American. Um, folk songs and you came along and conducted us. I, I remember um, yeah. and I can't remember who invited me um, but yes I I did indeed visit Romford. Yeah. It, was, so, it was church I was 14 go. and I was sitting there and you 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 said 
to us that we were a wonderful choir and we were all we we lit up at that. Oh, incredible! Moment. Well, I try never to pay compliments that are not <laughs> sincere, so I expect you were a wonderful oh, that's, choir. That's great. Um, so that's, but, uh, just, I, I, that's, I, that's I, a memory. I, I would just like to echo Ben, if I may, uh, John, your kindness. Um, and, and all of the people we work with, Nigel Short of Tenebrae and others, uh, mm. Marina, Marina Marla, who is our president, um, mm. uh, and others say what, what a kind and generous man you are. And, and, and that was shown to me when I sang under your direction at the Marleybone Church for your creation, Come and Sing. And um, you had some of your own pieces that we learnt. And I walked up to you and you were sitting there kindly signing autographs. And I said, my daughter Tara has sung the Lord bless you and keep you at family occasions since she was seven years old. Could you, could you sign this this for 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 her? And you put two Tara on it and she's now in Kuala Lumpur as I speak, um, holding this score because I said I was talking to you tonight and she wants oh. me to pass on um, her great thanks to you. Um, but but you know your your kindness shines through, John, and and um, Ben's story I think shows that to 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 its greatest. Well, I I, I don't know whether it's kindness really. I mean, but the thing was I was brought up um, not only by my director of music at school to um, believe that music was for sharing, but um, I very much picked up that ethos from Sir David Wilcox. Mm -hmm. um, Cambridge, who was, uh, of course, uh, the legendary director of King's College Choir at the time, as well as director of the Bach Choir in London. And um, I owe him a huge debt. I mean, it was thanks to him that I first got into print while I was still a student, that he showed some of my manuscripts to Oxford University Press, who signed me up. I would never have had the temerity to do that myself, but I didn't have to because he did it for me. And over the years, he championed my work, gave me a great deal of leadership by example, you might say, and um, tactful mentoring, and uh, somebody yeah. whose loyalty was really a lifelong thing. Now, what was important about him was not only what he did with King's College Choir, um, setting standards that made everybody else raise their game, but um, his willingness to go out and do Messiah in the, uh, I know the place really exists, but if I say Nether Wallop, um, just take that to mean any small um, place um, where there's a brave local choir, and even at the height of his fame, and when he was just more busy than any human being could possibly be, if he had one spare day, he would zip down there at high speed in his car, do a messiah with the local singers, and they would go home walking on air. Lovely. Because Lovely. they just felt, well, we didn't know we could do it that well. Yeah. Um, he, he had the gift of making people who were willing amateurs um, do better than their best. And I don't quite know how he did it, but he believed that if he had a musical gift, um, it was not right to just keep it to himself. Um, so, he wanted so what to would he out. think, John, what would he think then, as an, in, as an interesting question, for, I'd love to know what he might think of the way that digital music has progressed and that his, his uh, descants and his music might be heard by and learnt by people who never meet. Well, he did have a fairly good taste of that because, of course, he did travel quite widely in yeah. a number of countries and um, Wilcox's descants were just as popular in New Zealand or Canada or yeah. Australia or mm. particularly the USA mm. as they ever were in Cambridge. And so he realised that the work that he did, um, both writing and conducting and recording, reached people all over the world. And of course, after the um, annual um, radio and then the television broadcasts of Carols from Kings um, yeah. each year, um, he would get sackloads of mail. 
Um, and I was sometimes there in his office in King's College and I would see this huge pile of letters that would come in from all over, mostly warm with praise, but um, there were always those who um, complained in the early 70s where somebody said, well, um, those this young men in the back rows, disgraceful, they had long hair, some of them <laughs> on their shoulders. And he wrote back saying, well, you know, was it not the case that our Lord himself had a long hair? Um, he, always had, he always had an elegant um, reply to those, and of course those who didn't like contemporary music um, uh, and said, well, these modern composers of today have no idea how to write a good tune. And well, you know, now do you know Bells Across the Snow by Dr. Arkwright? Now there's a carol for you. <laughs> um, and he said, well, no, I believe I haven't come across Dr. Arkwright's carol, but I shall make it my business to <laughs> seek it out in the <laughs> university library at the earliest opportunity. Oh, well, that he would deal personally, every reply was handwritten, um, hundreds of them. And uh, so I learned a lot about the way a musician should conduct their life um, because he was a shining example of it. Somebody in a very prominent and public position um, who believed in reaching out to everybody. Uh, uh, friends with some of the most lofty, distinguished professionals, you know, Dame Janet Baker and Peter Pierce, and of course, Benjamin Britten, he knew very well. Um, but at the same time, somebody who was happy to spend time um, with those who um, wanted him to come and conduct in a New Zealand summer school somewhere, um, you know, mm -hmm. and, or, or just that Messiah in Nether Wallop. Yeah, and amazing. I spent quite a lot of time with him in the late 60s and early 70s, and um, then a, a bit into his years at the Royal College of Music as principal, where he did a terrific job. I mean, not only inspiring the students, but fundraising for the RCM. And um, we collaborated on the... Um, 100 Carols for Choirs yes, yes. volume. That was You're not until 1987, actually. Have you got that now, Ben? Oh, I've, got the, I've got the full set. Yes. You've got it there. Um, <laughs> and so um, I, I think, actually, um, I was very lucky to have good mentoring and a, a terrific shining example um, from somebody who evidently liked my work and believed in me and, and supported what I did right up until shortly before his death. And um, it was a life very fully lived. I mean, after he reached 90, um, Rachel, his, um, his wonderful wife, um, decided it was no longer a good idea for him to go out and conduct concerts here, there and everywhere. And his health wasn't the greatest. And she said, well, how would you feel if you sort of collapsed, um, sort of in the middle of, of doing one of those really big choir concerts in the Albert Hall, you know, you'd feel terrible about it. And, yeah. You know, but if the phone would ring, he'd pick it up and say, David Wilcox here. And so, well, you know, Sir David, we were just wondering if you might be willing to come and, and do a, a Verdi Requiem for us in Bristol. Yes, it's absolutely delighted. And Rachel would seize the phone and would say, Sir David is not available for public concerts. <laughs> Why not? Nothing wrong with me. Absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah. um, and so uh, he had to be restrained from conducting uh, towards the end of his life because well, it was his lifeblood. Music making was his lifeblood. And I think it's mine too. Um, and so we're very different people and we've done very different things, but uh, we're all influenced by the people who have taught us, whether it's a, a formal teacher-pupil relationship or whether it's somebody we've just met and got to know and been inspired by. And so um, really, uh, I think those were the two most important figures for me. I had a wonderful composition teacher, um, well, first at, at school, really, because Edward Chapman, our director of music, was a rather good composer and had been a pupil of Charles Wood. 
Now that's a name known to church musicians because yes. of Hail Gladdening Light. And of course, if you've ever sung Ding Dong Merry on High, you have probably done that in the Charleswood harmonization. Yes. Now he taught my director of music um, in Cambridge in the 1920s. So I think I got quite a lot of, of Dr. Wood's um, ideas passed on um, via Edward Chapman. And Wood was a meticulous craftsman he never let anything be published unless it was thoroughly finished and well done. You know, if he hadn't been a composer, he might have been a cabinet maker, um, you know, like Chippendale or something. He would have done absolutely beautiful, um, well-turned or pewter, you know, lovely pewter mugs, um, a sort of artisan composer. And John, he was not. The central orb. Did he do a vow? The, oh, the central orb was certainly one of his. That's absolutely right. I had that at my wedding. We were, we were lucky yes. enough to get married in a big, mm. big place, and we had that at my wedding. And it was it's just a light, it's an amazing piece of music. Well, yes, his music is still very much enjoyed and appreciated because it was built to last, like that Chippendale cabinet, you know. Um, and uh, so I got quite a lot of, of his thoughts from Edward Chapman. And then, of course, at Cambridge, um, I never had composition lessons as such from David Wilcox, but of course I learned from what he did um, uh, and how he wrote so beautifully for the choir and the acoustic of yeah. King's College Chapel. Yeah. And my composition teacher um, was um, a very distinguished man called Patrick Gowers, um, who, whose grandson, let's get this right, no, Patrick's son um, won the Fields Medals, mathematics. Um, Patrick's grandson, Richard Gowers, was an uh, organ scholar at King's College in, well. in recent days. And going back, Patrick's grandfather wrote a, a very influential book called Plain Words, which was a style guide for members of the civil service that got very well, widely we, used. We, we need to interrupt you, John, there and say that Richard Gowers, uh, whom we know very well, has, oh! played, has played the organ, the piano for us. He, has, he did the organ for, for so many pieces of music. He's arranged some Orthodox church music for us. He's just, in fact, finished an arrangement that Ben is going to teach v next week for O Comfici from Messiah into SATB. Oh, um, okay. So Richard is, is such a wonderful young man. He is a, he is a complete star and we know him well, very, very well. When you next see him, um, say how fondly I remember his granddad. Oh, um, I as I think he does, he plays, Patrick wrote a wonderful organ toccata, um, which is a very fingery piece indeed. And I know that Richard has that in his repertoire and that um, well, he he's has fond memories of Patrick, um, who always slightly disapproved of me. Um, and I don't mind you sharing this a bit with Richard, but um, when Patrick and I um, came to the end of our natural time together, um, because he was my composition supervisor, actually, well, for four whole years, because three years of my first degree and then for my Bachelor of Music, um, he slightly thought that what I was writing should be beneath me, um, and that, that all these carols and things were all very well, but uh, where was the mighty symphony? Um, <laughs> and, well, uh, he, he sort of gave me a little bit of a lecture um, in a friendly way and said, well, you should be doing much better things than you are. I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we didn't meet then. Uh, we, we sort of stayed in touch, sort of on and off, but we last um, really met. Uh, it was at a luncheon, um, one of these industry luncheons, and he was there. Um, and I suppose this was when I was, mm, I must have been getting on for 60, if not. A little more at the time but he said well of course you should have been doing much better things than you have been <laughs> we had this conversation patrick 40 years ago and um I, i'm afraid i'm going to be forever a disappointment to you and uh, i i shared this story with a composer friend of mine called nigel hess who's very gifted he writes mostly for television and films and um, he did the score for ladies in lavender which is lovely 
But what I didn't know was that he was a Patrick Gower's pupil, as oh. I had been. And uh, Nigel said, well, you know, Patrick, yes, well, he was such a brilliant guy, but oh dear, I know I was a disappointment to him. <laughs> so it's funny you should say that. So was I a disappointment to him. And I said, we should form a club. Maybe there are other of, others of his composition pupils who we all thinks haven't fulfilled what they should have done. Um, but anyway, do share that with, um, with young Richard. Um, my goodness me, the, the, the Gowers family is bursting with um, genius um, yeah. on the generation. So really? there you go. <laughs> oh, amazing. Happy, happy memory. <laughs> Very much so. Look, John, um, just as I've got you here, there's a, a question I've, I've wanted to ask you for years, and it, it very much ties in with what we've been discussing about um, technology and, and looking forward. I will always remember um, the first time I encountered a score program on the computer. Mm. And uh, it was at secondary school. It was an Atari ST computer running uh, a very, very, very basic program. And I thought that was kind of the pinnacle of technology. And then along came Finale and then Sibelius. And I remember my director of music saying, well, of course, John Rutter uses this software and he produces his scores and uh, and that's what OUP uses. Is that the case? That you, you're one of the first big name composers really to, to embrace this score creation technology? I was an early adopter I think they call them for Sibelius. I got um, a mail out from uh, the very first um, version of Sibelius was produced, I think it was 1993 or thereabouts. And I had of course been aware that there were music notation programs out there. And to be honest, I didn't really like the look of the scores they produced. I thought they were a bit clunky, not very elegant. And um, then I looked at Sibelius and thought, ah, this is in a different league. This actually looks like good classic engraving, music engraving, which of course was a, a highly craft process, very um, skilled and mm. passed from father to son and all the rest of it. There were never terribly many music engravers in the world. And in the days when you actually used brass punches um, and you had to work back to front and uh, 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 imagine miniature scores when those were done same size. I mean, the um, the engravers used to go blind. Um, uh, it was just one of the occupational hazards. But anyway, um, I thought Sibelius, gosh, this looks good. And I got in touch with them. And I then discovered that it was the work of two twin brothers who had both been choristers in King's College Choir. And I thought, well, that's a good start. And they had, for their own interest, developed Sibelius when they were, went on to secondary school because they were computer minded. This was the days of the Acorn computer, the Archimedes as it was then called. And they were both of quite a mathematical turn of mind. And they thought perhaps we can use this new computer to put music on paper. So they devised Sibelius and then um, they went, one came, well, Ben came to um, Kings, back to Kings to, read philosophy and his twin brother Jonathan went to Oxford to Christchurch to do music and so their ways parted but they were pretty much telepathic and uh, always had been actually and shortly after they graduated they came back together and said why don't we market this commercially and so I got one of the first mail shots and I thought it's got terrific possibilities and I and a small army of other users bombarded them on a daily basis with, well, it was phone calls in those days saying, why won't it do this? Or could you make it do that? Or I'm having a problem with the other. And within what was usually a matter of 48 hours, I'd get an update floppy disk through the post. That's what you used in those days. Amazing. With an update and 
um, they'd say, well, just, just put this in and it's fixed the problem or it will now do whatever it is that you want to do. Now, um, my particular interests were choral and orchestral music, but there were jazz musicians, brass band musicians, avant-garde musicians, all sorts who wanted Sibelius to be able to do different things. And they were all contributing to a process of development and improvement. And then the day come when they, when they realized that they would have to um, translate it into a Mac and a PC version because it only worked on the Acorn platform, which was starting to become obsolete and never had been all that widely adopted. But at the time they adopted it as their platform, it was the only one fast enough to actually do the job. And so I asked them, well, how intricate is this process? Because you've done all the programming yourselves. And they said, we will have to hire people to do it. And that's when the business began to expand because they said it's not like translating a novel into French or something. It's like writing a whole new novel. Mm. Um, you more or less have to start again um, with the different architecture of the Windows and the Mac platforms. But they did it. Um, the company was very successful. They set themselves a goal to retire by the time they were 30, which they didn't quite achieve. Um, they, they were, I think, 32 or 33 when they sold the company to Avid, which is an American company. Yep. And um, they've been able to please themselves ever since because it was a very successful sale. Mm. It was an absolutely excellent product. I knew it would be a world beater because they had a determination to go the extra mile and just make it that much mm. more um, efficient, yeah. easier to use, versatile um, than any of the competition. And so it was a very well-merited success and it changed the working lives of thousands upon thousands of musicians, because in a way we went in one bound from the middle ages to the computer age. Yes. Um, because if a medieval monk had eavesdropped in my study any time up to the early 1990s, he would have seen something he recognized. I dipped my pen into an ink pot and I wrote in ink with a, a broad nib, um, pretty much like a quill would have been really. Um, and if I made a mistake, I had to scratch it out with a razor blade or a knife and have another go. And so it was important to try and get things right. Um, if you miscalculated the number of bars that would fit on a page, you had to tear the page up and start again. Um, it was very labor intensive, but we all got used to that because there was no alternative. There was no, not really a musical typewriter. There was one, but it was never widely adopted and it wasn't all that terrifically good, to be honest. And so uh, we went, we leapfrogged over a whole century of technology. Um, and lo and behold, um, composers the world over, um, arrangers, publishers, are all making use of Sibelius or its competitors to put music on paper with a standard of professionalism that was just not possible before. Um, and I, I was actually the first composer um, in the Oxford University Press stable to submit all my um, work in finished product form. And wow. so if you've sung anything of mine, um, written after about 1994. Um, the right typesetting right you see is my own. <laughs> did you, did, did, am I right in thinking you, you set your Magnificat? Yeah, no, the Magnificat was the, uh, the, the full scores um, are my own typesetting. Yeah. The um, original vocal score was one of the last things that was done with the old process because I wrote that in 1990. So um, it was really anything after that, the mass of the children, um, uh, the gift of life, and of course all the small um, choral pieces and odds and ends, um, those are all my own um, typesetting. And uh, I, I'm proud to say that yes, it does get proofread by the publisher, but it goes through exactly the way that I um, uh, set it. So um, I had to learn a whole new skill um, very useful it has been. Sure, and very useful it has been.
And interesting you say that it leapfrogged uh, a century of development, and some might say bringing it back round to digital choirs, that we, we had to do a similar sort of yeah. learning process and a similar sort of leapfrogging that anyone, uh, say say Berlioz, had, had, had come forward in time and had sat in one of my regular rehearsals, he'd recognise exactly what we're doing now, surprise, oh, yeah. no matter, no one together. And then suddenly during the pandemic, we had to leap forward into a digital age. And I doubt he would look at my setup here with everything all plugged in and talking yeah. to the camera. I think he'd have uh, felt like that medieval monk in your study, perhaps. Yes. Well, uh, it's been a remarkable time to be active as a musician and composer, and I wouldn't have chosen any other period. One reason actually being that um, in my lifetime, the climate of, of musical judgment has become so much more open and welcoming. Hmm. But I lived through the um, slightly Stalinist avant-garde period in the 1960s, um, which was spearheaded, I suppose, really by the regime at the BBC under William Glock, who um, said, you know, the way forward is um, Boulez and Stockhausen and those who have followed in the second Viennese school footsteps. And it was very hard to get a hearing if he wrote any other way. Mm. And now um, I think it was a necessary corrective to what had become maybe a slightly stuck in the in its own um, ways, um, set in its ways, um, musical culture. Um, but um, I knew from very young age that whatever gift I might have for writing, it wasn't for writing music in the kind of then approved avant-garde style. Oh, yeah. um, Richard Rodney Bennett had much the same experience when he went to study with Pierre Boulez in Paris. And he said he wouldn't have missed it for anything. He had a, a very stimulating year, but he came back to London saying, that's not how I want to write. Mm -hmm. And you've only got to listen to Murder on the Orient Express or any of those wonderful film scores or his lovely choral music mm -hmm. to know that um, he chose a different path. Mm -hmm. And that's now something that's very much more allowed. And um, of course, all kinds of composers of different gifts are getting a hearing now in a way that they perhaps couldn't when I started out. One of the reasons I think I concentrated um, on choral music is that it was still kind of all right to put a key signature in, to write a tune if one happened to occur to you. Um, the, the melodic aspect of music has always been important to me and I would feel um, slightly deprived if I didn't have the chance to write music that's got a tune, to put it crudely. <laughs> we, 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 we in the Choir of the Earth, John, would applaud that hugely. We, we have uh, our Kleenex right next to us as we learn this music that Ben teaches us and Ralph teaches us so well. Um, melody is, is all, uh, almost everything. Um, I mean, sometimes melody takes a while to arrive because um, you you may or may not listen to it and, and get the melody on the first hearing. But uh, nowadays with Spotify, music is so readily available. Um, you know, you don't have to wait for the your local concert hall to 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 do a Mozart no. symphony, which may only come around every two or three years. And I think did, did Ben was it you who told me that you were you were rich in your culture if you'd seen Beethoven's Ninth Symphony three or four times in your life. You, you, you read about these these people in the you know, 19th century before recorded sound who would travel the world seeking out performances of these great works. And yes, someone who had seen a Beethoven Symphony three times you know, would be considered uh, a, a, a great... Uh, and why yeah. musician but now of course we can just tap a button and we can hear anything we want and exactly. we myriad of different performances uh, we're we're truly blessed i think at this point. oh we are, we are and recordings have been our best teacher in some ways because one of the reasons i think the standard of choirs has improved so hugely in my lifetime is that we can compare ourselves with the best of the recordings that other choirs have made mm -hmm. and they have spurred us all on to raise our game. Mm -hmm. um, it was the case when I was a kid that you would go and hear a large choral society and um, they would routinely sing flat, they would sing behind the beat, 
and the orchestras would play in tune and in time. And uh, I knew nothing, but I remember thinking as a teenager, well, <clears throat> why is that okay? Exactly. Um, exactly. And uh, I think if there's been one achievement among choirs in my lifetime, it's that we have come to expect the best of them to be just as accomplished as our orchestras are. Um, as quick to sight read, as adept with their technique, um, as quick to pick up different styles and work in different ways. And uh, you can see that with a group like the Fieri Consort. Um, there absolutely were not groups like that when I was starting out, or there certainly weren't as many of them. Um, it was a rarity to find a small group of singers who would be perfectly attuned stylistically and musically to each other, uh, who would be knowledgeable about centuries of different repertoire, who would play um, like a string quartet, if you see what I mean. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's something where there's lots of them now, and that's absolutely wonderful. And the professional mixed choirs um, that, that we've got now in abundance in this country, and gosh, how lucky we are with the 16 and Tenebrae and Aura and uh, the Monteverdi Choir and so on. They were not there mm -hmm. when I was growing up. And they're there now, setting terrific standards. No, it's, it's, um, I mean, if you heard Aura record um, the James Macmillan 40 part motet, um, that would not have been possible um, 40 years ago. There just wouldn't have been the singers with the equipment to do it. I tell you um, what, I tell you what would not have been possible, John, when that is uh, over 2,000 of us singing Speminalium at the same time. <laughs> Golly, yes. yes. So that, that was well, Speminalium was considered a Mount Everest, really, of the choral world. And I was around when it was first performed in Cambridge, um, 1965 or six, I think it was. And it was the university chorus known as COMS Cund. Um, under Sir David Wilcox. Yeah, I went to Bristol uh, University. We have the Bristol University Music Society, or BUMS. BUMS. Well, <laughs> but you see, it was like the four-minute mile, because once somebody's done it, then uh, it kind of gives permission and inspiration for others to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure lots of university choirs have done it with very good success. It's become pretty much almost standard repertoire, but it was considered um, just something that was so complex as to be really out of reach and you could admire the score, um, huge as it is, um, but to actually sing it, oh no. Uh, and now um, there it is, lots of choirs can do it. I mean, my most memorable performance, I haven't conducted it often, but I did do it live in the Piazza San Marco in the open air in Venice um, with, with my college choir augmented somewhat. This was, um, oh golly, back in the late 1970s. And I'll let you into a secret. The acoustics of the Piazza San Marco Square are hopeless. Um, never sing in the open air. Um, but it's, oh, it really is a bit of a dead loss. Um, we sang it then inside um, San Marco, and it's fantastic. Oh, um, it's perhaps the reverb a little too much for the music, but um, I, I, I certainly remember it. And of course, it's a highlight. And there you opened up that experience of singing the piece. How many singers did you have to do it? Oh, well, yeah. Sorry, Ben, you go. Well, yeah. Yeah, I was I was going to say I, in total we had two thousand voices, but one of the great things about this uh, this choir that we have is that we in actively encourage people to record multiple parts, multiple. Ah. Parts. So we had I think it was about seven hundred mark, wasn't it? it actually, yeah. in the choir, but some people actually did four or five different parts and sent that in, and so it's it's a huge mixture of, of different voices but in some cases some people recorded soprano uh, all the soprano parts and all the alto parts and yeah. a couple of the tenor parts um, which in itself I think is a really exciting development in terms of choral music um, we, we've just finished a, uh, a course where I taught the Mozart uh, great mass in C minor which sure. is just one of my all-time 
Christmas. Yes, it's not done as often as the no, Requiem, it's... and I wish it was, um, partly because I think there's the double choir writing, which adds a little bit of complexity. And yeah. my gosh, you've got to have good soloists for yes. it. Um, we have the Fieri consort, who are... Oh, well, there you are. Um, good. I mean, Lucy Cox singing the Et Incarnatus Est, I mean, she was just phenomenal. But that, that Qui Tollis... Mm. Uh, that immense double chorus. Yes, uh, I sang it uh, when years and years ago here in Bristol at, at St Mary Redcliffe, beautiful church, with mm. the Baroque Orchestra, and I remember being actually genuinely gutted to use a Romford term, gutted oh. to to only be able to sing one of the bass parts. Oh. I remember begging my conductor, "Can I please sing bass two? It's my favourite." No, I need you on bass one because I've already got strong singers on bass two. I need someone on bass one. Whereas, of course, with our choir, you can sing both, you can sing tenor, you can record yes. it and actually get that wonderful experience. So, yes, the, the SPEM, um, the, the final product is really quite something. Well, John, what I'll do with it, if I may, is I will send you a link to Nigel Short, who taught it to us, conducting it 40 mm. times on the screen. Mm. Um, and and he comes in and out uh, as to when a particular choir or particular voice is is required. It's 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 it just shows what modern technology can do. It's and just it's to remarkable. add in, it, visually, it's really quite something. My uh, my mother in law, um, who throughout her life has had some interaction with the deaf community, was moved to tears by watching oh. this particular performance because. Even if you can't hear a single note, you have a uniquely visual representation of SPEM because Nigel is conducting into the camera every single part so you see it emerging like, like waves on the screen. It's actually fascinating to watch. Um, and, yeah, very powerful as well. It, it, well, it's a powerful piece. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, he understood one of the basic rules of composition, which is don't throw all your resources in at once. Mm -hmm. Save them up. And so the moments when all four voices do come together are shattering. Yeah. Um, and then the silence, of course, silence is, is before the respite yes. moment. Yes. Um, yes. It's so eloquent. It is. Um, so I'm sure Thomas Tallis would love to, uh, well, sitting on his cloud, perhaps he can enjoy your performance, but nobody really knows when it was first done, if ever, there's the theory, might have been in celebration of Queen Elizabeth's 40th birthday. And it was certainly um, inspired by Strigio's Ecce Beatum Lucem, which was another 40 part motet, but I'll let you into a secret, I've recorded that, and I never used it in the end because it's not really all that good a piece. It doesn't compare with the Talis. Um, Talis actually, um, in this particular case, uh, proved that British was best. <laughs> he, he, of course, um, interacted with, uh, despite the difficulty of travel in those days, composers uh, did manage to hear quite a lot of one another's work and they studied manuscripts. There were no scores, of course, that you could only look at voice parts and put them all together. So goodness knows how you got an idea of what 40 part motet sounded like. Um, a lot of mysteries, but you brought it to life. What an achievement. Well, that's very kind of you, John. And, and as one last question, if I may, um, do you see as we move forward with our music making over the next uh, few years as the pandemic thankfully comes to a, to uh, some form of close that this form of digital music making will continue do you see it do you see it as something that adds to the music mix or do you see it as a phenomenon that that came and may may sort of disappear oh i think it will continue um, as part of the music mix as you rightly say um, because of the people who can join in who perhaps can't join in the conventional choir and for those who simply can't get enough of choral singing i mean i'm sure you know there are quite a few people who sing in more than one choral society and so you know there's one on tuesday nights and another one on friday nights and yes. that's great yes. i think there will certainly be those who um got such a kick out of being able to take part in these virtual performances that they will continue. Inevitably, as people get back to their in-the-flesh choirs, 
um, there will not be as much space in their lives Correct. for virtual choir singing. Um, but um, I think it has taken its place already and will continue to play a very important part in our choral culture. Um, so I, it, it's something I absolutely applaud and have been delighted to see springing up. Um, it always takes the initiative of one or two visionary people to get that sort of a thing started. Um, but um, you know when you've stumbled on a good idea, um, when it just takes off, as I think you found numbers wise, you were astounded at how many people wanted to sign up for your projects. Isn't that the case? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. We, we thought um, we'd get, we thought we might get a hundred people from a sign. Yeah. And um, when we, when I gave the downbeat at the first rehearsal, we had three and a half thousand. Yeah, that's extraordinary. And from all well, over the world. Um, and, and you're absolutely right when you say there are those who just can't get enough. There's a, uh, we've got hmm. some, some very keen singers in Finland, and one of them refers to herself and her husband as choir dogs. I thought, what do you mean by that? She said, well, we're available. If someone whistles, we come and sing. Oh, I, just, I just think that's lovely. the lovest expression. Yeah. Um, well, you, you've discovered them. And, of course, despite everything, the rarest and most valuable currency in the whole world is ideas. That that will never be superseded. Never. There and will always be new ideas. The human being always has new ideas, John. Yeah, uh, it, humans have ideas, and some are genius, some are good, some are okay, some are bad ideas. Um, but you never know what, what you've thought of until you try it mm. in yeah. practice. And if you never conduct experiments, you never make discoveries. And I think, in a way, you would probably say that you started with it as an experiment. Yeah. And you, my goodness, you made a discovery. And um, I think that's a remarkable thing. And it has opened up the world of choral singing to a whole lot of people. Um, if I had one little hope, it would be that quite a number of those who've had their first experience of choral singing from being in the choir of the earth might then also join a real flesh and blood choir um, because um, that is something that needs to be strengthened around the nation. Um, the, there's an issue that I think people of my generation who grew up singing in school um, have wanted to carry on. But there is a generic problem, I think, particularly with men, that if they haven't sung when they were little lads, then they probably won't take it up later in life. Mm. Um, and not always, um, but I've always found that with the come and sing days I do around the country and beyond, that the men are outnumbered by the women. And that's just something that really is a product of the fact that um, not that many men actually um, below the age of 60, say, were ever in a church choir or a school choir. Um, because church choirs don't exist in the quantity that they once did, sadly. No. And school choirs, well, we've talked about that. Mm. Um, again, there are um, pockets of excellence um, and schools that still care about choral singing, but there are plenty that I'm afraid to say don't care enough. And if you don't start them young, it's always harder to catch them later. But I think your project has actually made it possible for um, men and women too who didn't think of singing or didn't discover it at school to discover it later. And I think there are some things so good that maybe it's worth saving them up until you're mature enough to fully appreciate them. <laughs> um, and having said which, I was never happier as a little kid than when I was, um, never happier than when I was singing. So um, but maybe I've followed them through my whole life. Maybe that's a lesson we learned from Talis. Save it up for a bit yeah. later on. Save it up and have a big respite at a, at a key point big, in life. And, a, and a big, a big respite. Well, on on the, the the point of saving it up, John, we're going to save this uh, up for a couple of days before we give it to the choir. Thank you so much, John. It's been a privilege uh, to talk with you. Thank you for sharing all your insights. And um, uh, for the moment, John Rutter, thank you very much indeed.
my pleasure entirely. Thank you for having me.